thank you so much for inviting me and uh, to, to um, have a conversation with Hope. And I also want to say um, thank you to Andrea Wolfer, who I don't know if she's here, but she's the person who wrote the chapter in my book, But Is It Art, about Hope. And it's a really wonderful essay. So I hope you all get to have read it or will, will get to read it. So I'm um, really, really sort of impressed by how timely both these shows are. And one of the things that's interesting to me, I didn't know this, Midori, that your show has been in the planning stage for five years. Um, I, I do understand shows can take that long. And I don't know, Hope, when your show was first supposed to open. But um, one of the things that um, strikes me is just how um, incredibly timely, and in fact, in some ways, because of the impact of the pandemic on so many aspects of lives, and certainly in terms of um, increasing the rate of um, homelessness, and also some of the reasons for homelessness, including um, an increase in violence against women and intimate um, partner um, violence. And um, so, and you know, also just in general, inequity is greater than it's ever been. So, in, and it's also interesting that it happens that um, my book was supposed to be republished around the same time you guys, you know, produced your shows. Uh, it fell through, but the, the feeling about that also is that, you know, um, homelessness is um, extremely, a very, very timely issue. Um, so I just quickly to say how I got to know Hope, it was really in relation to the book many, many years ago. That's more than 25 years ago at this point. Um, and what's also interesting about Hope is that uh, several of the chapters in the book involve people, artists that Hope has worked with, the Guerrilla Girls and WAC, WAC uh, Women's Action Coalition. So her, her work was very timely then and it continues to be. Um, what struck me particularly about Hope's practice um, is the, a, a unique aspect of Hope's practice. I mean, there are many wonderful aspects of it, but one of them for me is how it involves two more than one community. It, um, and, and also I think I see it as a kind of, um, that it has empowered more than one community, often with these activist um, art projects or participatory collective art projects. It's a community that is the subject of the work that is um, intended to be empowered and participate. But with Hope's practice, she also brought a lot of artists into it. And so I think in the process, it empowers artists and it gets them to think about their own work and the issues that they are involved with. So I think it's a very expansive, generous project. And um, I think, um, you know, I just, my hat's off to Hope still. I think that project mm -hmm. was really innovative and extraordinary. Um, so Hope, I'm gonna first, I'd first like to ask you about what um, social issues at that time um, directly affected artists and underserved communities and how the Artists and Homeless Collaborative addressed those issues. The screen, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that first I wanna thank Maureen, Midori and Tom Jason and Rob for their invitation to be amongst colleagues participating in their timely exhibition on homeless New York City. For this great op opportunity to talk with Nina, who I, I found her book so inspiring and important because we were an ad hoc group of artists with these projects, whether it be visual aids, which as you know, there was huge backlash against people with AIDS. Uh, are the Gorilla Girls advocating for feminism and representation of women and WAC. And I participated, I was a member of WAC. I went to every protest, it was so empowering. Um, and I was part of the Artist Caucus for Visual Aids. So, and many other groups too. 
I couldn't get enough of that feeling of our working together collectively like I'd had amongst my colleagues in the East Village I showed at Gracie Mansion. Um, and when AIDS hit in, eight, in 85, I started losing them. And everything that meant so much to me about being in the art world. So that was how I started to really question the relevancy of art to life. And they lost their lives. I was curious what happened for people I saw on the streets but were now in the shelters when they lost the place they belonged to or they felt they belonged to. And many of the women that were in the shelters have suffered like I had from rape and abuse and violence. So I was, I was really interested to see how that uh, affected them as it had affected me, because I do suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome too. So I was really, um, really taken when I went to the family shelter first and saw how they were dealing with the issues. And then as we go on, we'll see that I was then told not to come back again and went to the Park Avenue Armory Shelter. And now we'll start here. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, that bar is in front of it. Can you read that, a question for each of us to consider? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so this is when I first went there. I had that question to the second shelter, the Park Avenue Armory Shelter, and came with, I had a Polaroid grant. I came with Polaroid cameras and asked the women to work with me in making art having them picture the shelter themselves. And then in the next, that was the first six months. And then I convinced my colleagues to come because I really felt that it was important for artists to make art from what they experienced themselves firsthand. So going into the shelter, they could experience firsthand what people who suffered from violence and poverty um, had. And this quote is really meaningful to me from Lanzetta. When I started the newsletter, um, I had a box where people could, where the residents could set, put their submissions and then I organized it and printed it on our computer. But thanks to my husband, none of this would be possible. And um, this is one of the quotes that in an essay that Lanzetta had offered, and here she is painting. This is a paint, a, one of the first part, the second project called The Four Seasons led by artist Keiko Bank. And you can see the intensity of the people painting, of the women painting. These are stills from the video that Midori chose. And here, I'm not sure how large you can see this, but there's too much, too long a list of artists to name. Here's just some of them that participated. Can you see that at all? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yes. Okay. I'll give you a second to read it. It was my pleasure to work with all my colleagues. And, and what's fabulous is, even after all these years, people still remember. And when we had the show, it was quite a great reunion to talk about what this experience made for us. Unfortunately, the women that participated that were shelter residents had most had all died. You know, they were 20 to 30 years older than us. And the curators, I want to thank the curators uh, of the show, Art for Change. The Artists and Homeless Collaborative presented generously by the New York Historic Society. Um, Rebecca and Laura tried very hard to track down every single woman that participated in our project because I had all the documentation and they had all passed away. So here I am a steward of many people's works 
and I'm really proud to be here and show it to you for you to see what they had to say when they can't be here to represent themselves. And here's that painting hanging in the shelter. This is the third floor of the Park Avenue Armory, which you've probably been to for performances. So what's the composition of these mural paintings? Fought by uh, the bong, Keiko bongs, or was it coming from the homeless participant? The, the shelter residents. Oh, Basically, she worked with the idea with them. They had the idea of the Four Seasons, and she worked with them to develop it into these images and taught them how to paint. Most of them had never painted before. And they sketched, they put a ground down and sketched and then made these images. You can see how, what? You, I, was, I, was, I was just curious to know how many hours or days or whatever Keiko Bunk worked with the women because learning how to paint is not something that happens after one hour for sure. All the artists that did projects were committed to coming for six weeks wow. whenever they said that they would come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be over their shoulder. So I wasn't there except once a week, but they were free to come and go. And at the reception for the show that both Midori and Nina came, um, they were, the different artists I spoke to said they really appreciated that because then they could create their own communication um, with the participants. And I, because when I appeared, everyone knew they had to be very serious and very focused. So uh, my not being there gave them moments of hilarity and fun. <laughs> <laughs> because basically the project faced the fact that people wanted to call it art therapy or which I, I always said, well, I'm not an art therapist and neither are my colleagues are artists and we're here to make art. So I felt we had to make art that we'd be happy to show with our own work, as our own work. And here's the building, which I'm sure you're familiar with. On the outside, the women weren't allowed, the shelter residents weren't allowed to use this front entrance. They had to go around the side. And this was a room on the second floor. And this is part of the exhibition that Laura and Rebecca curated and organized. Uh, I had no part in the show per se. They basically chose the images and curated it. I opened my archives to them. And this is a picture of me with the women who were working on the piece, what I need, what I wish. Here's a close up. You can see how serious we are. And then on the fifth floor was the basketball court where they slept. You can see how dismal it is and how close they were. That's me speaking to Harper Kosh. And this video was made by my husband, Old Skokesberg, and it just really captures the atmosphere and the time. So here's a quote that represents, that really had a big influence on me as an artist because Marcel Duchamp's the largest collection of work is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art where I grew up. And so I started seeing, and I started seeing his work at a very young age. And I was really taken by this relevancy of art to life, which was the question I was asking when I went into the Catherine Street shelter, as I said, and also Park Avenue Armory. And here I am, I was an activist at a young age. I, um, here I am as Miss Cleaner Air, which is kind of hilarious, but I was very serious. Uh, I went and spoke about the importance of clean air. This is 1967. And basically I attribute all my activism and community engagement to my mother's family. Ironically, there's the war in Ukraine right now because that's where my grandfather fled. And most of my family from the turn of the 19th century and came here. 
We don't know what happened to my great great grandmother and grand and her husband Itzhak and Rivoli um, because they never got they never escaped. But apparently, it's a, tra a tradition that they taught about being generous to your community and being involved, no matter what you had or didn't have. So that's how I came to create the Artists and Homeless Collaborative. It just seemed logical with my background that I needed to examine, examine the issue of why people lost their homes and their place that they belong to from them, not from reading. And, and as I said, the loss of my friends to AIDS, here's my portraits of dear colleagues. On the right, Peter Hujar, the photographer. The top left is the artist and critic, art critic Nicholas Mufaraj, who was the subject two years ago of a show at the Queens Museum. And Keith Herring uh, on the bottom left, there we are at Juan Police Plaza. He looks very nonchalant, but he was afraid to be arrested. So they died way too young. And I felt it was time to connect with root issues of life, not just the art. Later on, uh, as I said, I became a member of Visual Aids and um, these projects, the green, the poster self-taught, self-represented was a project that was done in the shelter. It's the words, of the uh, shelter residents with the artists, Julie Carson and Carson Keppel. Many of the shelter residents had also lost friends to AIDS and family members. So as I said, there was a coming together of shared experiences between us artists and the shelter artists. And in the, um, as you might know, Visual AIDS is the creator of the Red Ribbon Project and artist Frank Moore, who also tragically died of AIDS. Um, but before he was sick, we created the Red Ribbon Armory Bee, which had a group of women who contracted to do work with visual aids by creating their red ribbons and being paid directly for it, their work. And here's a close-up of it, you can see positions available. So basically everything that I tried to initiate was to empower them to have their own say and their own direction. And that's true of this um, project because the resume project positions wanted opportunities needed. Much of what I was hearing from people when I spoke about what my experiences in the shelter were um, that these women were useless, had no backgrounds of work. They might be good for cleaning and cooking. And in fact, the city contracted with organizations to teach the women how to cook and clean for employment. And my thought was, well, I don't know anyone that can get a job or an apartment without a resume. So as part of my WAC membership, we created a subcommittee of Artists and Homeless Collaborative. And many women came, many WAC members came to the shelters and wrote up these resumes for the women. And then I had them printed and um, distributed them. And DIA Foundation hired two of the women to work at DIA. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. And this is a project that Robin Tews directed uh, called Something Lost, Something Gained. And we basically distributed squares of canvas to our colleagues, as well as the shelters, the, the two shelters that my project was in. And also I had created an art education project with Whitney, art education teacher, Dina Halal and also with MoMA Head of Education, Philip Yanowin. And there are many other people involved from Kirk Varnadu and Rob Stewart at MoMA and Agnes Gund. And then at the Whitney 
then director David Ross and head of education, Connie Wolf. Thelma Golden was the director of the Philip Mars space and Dina organized the education project. So these squares are made by all those different people. And here's a close up of one of them. I'll move on to the next slide of a project called What I Need, What I Wish. Many of our projects were directed for the women to say exactly what they needed to change their situation or what caused them to be. This piece memorializes this woman's son who was killed. This is a woman from the 25th Street shelter and she had been in prison. Many of the women had been in prison for minor drug offenses, which we still, our, our society still suffers from that imprisonment, incarceration. And she made this piece reflecting her situation. And I, I wanted people to read these and see these back then until now because this is the information we need to know to change our culture and our society. Here's it, several of the pieces. They were installed at the shelter on 25th Street too. And then of course it seemed logical for to collaborate with the Gorilla Girls and I invited them. And they sat down with the women and composed these three posters of, oh, of the text that the women wrote. So basically me and my colleagues were mediums for the shelter residents to express themselves, to provide materials and a place to say what they needed to say because there was, there was no other place in the shelter for them to do that. And this was a preliminary drawing about the posters. If you see in the bottom, it says the women at home fight wars, what are their benefits? Well, I was saying to Nina and Midori the other day that a lot of people think that the women live there freely at the shelter or any of the shelters. But in fact, any benefits that they receive from disability or Medicaid or Medicare are paid, they're charged for staying at the shelter. So it's very hard to earn money to leave. The women in this shelter that you saw pictured were uh, from 40 years old to 80. Many of them suffered from uh, losing their job because they were getting older, you know, ageism, again, prejudice against women, gender discrimination, because many of them were gay and they couldn't live in their communities. In the younger women's shelter on 25th Street, they were living at that shelter so they could live openly with their girlfriends. And then there were the women that were hiding from their husbands who were threatening to kill them and their children and they couldn't see their children anymore. There were women that had cancer, had just been released from the hospital and lost their jobs while they were hospitalized and then had no place to go. They lost their apartments too. So hard to imagine having cancer and surgery and treatment and then having to live at the shelter. One of the residents had a great sense of humor and these, she made a series called Shelter Funnies. Her name was Audrey Jackson. <laughs> and here's the director of the shelter, Marie Brody, discussing with me this room, which was called the TV room. 
which was shared by all the residents and how dismal it was. And this was the first project that was done by, led by Pepan Asario. And in the video, you'll see it's completed and here, that's me, hard to believe, but 1992, 91, um, with one of the residents, you can see the real affection and how happy we look that the room is, is completed. It was our first project. And I wanted to show you what Paipan said about it. And below that is Geraldine Womack, who is a resident. I thought of her as the real director of the shelter. She knew everything that was going on and it seemed like anything that happened went through her. She was very dynamic. She was part of every project. And I actually collaborated on the next, next artwork with her. As I said, I gave the women Polaroid cameras and both Edna and Geraldine. The piece on the right is called The Life of Edna Diaz. The one on the left, The Life of Geraldine Womack. And they made the Polaroid pictures, both memorializing their sons killed, both murdered. And the idea was to show the basic representation of women that are lose their homes. Um, on the left is a portrait by Michael O'Neill of Geraldine Womack that is meant to look like those inspirational pictures that you shouldn't feel sorry for the person because they're gonna be okay. And the one of Edna crying is, is a portrait I made of her. I hadn't planned that she would cry, but she's thinking about her son and pictured in the coffins, in the coffin that had died. And then I wrote newspaper, film, newspaper articles of the type that you'd find that would be very impersonal and just statistics of who these homeless people were. And the idea was to present the personal as well as the um, public view of homeless people and the same artwork. And they had a part in making the entire work. These are life casts made by John Ahern and Rigoberto Torres. It's called, the piece is titled Ernestine and Three Friends. And this is actually how the show came about at New York Historic Society. This piece was donated to them when Lenox Hill took over the shelter from the city when it was, the shelter was privatized. And they were wondering, what is Artists and Homeless Collaborative? So they called me up and said, Rebecca phoned and said, what is Artists and Homeless Collaborative and who are you? And what, is, what do you have to do with it? And that became our conversation. And then they invited me to participate in the show that they presented. And so that's exactly how it all happened. Yeah. Um, Rigoberto and John were at the shelter every Tuesday night for our workshops, along with a whole other group of artists and it was, and the art resident artists. So there was a lot of fun and exchange and conversation. And these are paintings made by Ada, Ida Applebrook with the artists. Like John Ahern said, they look like Ida Applebrook paintings, but actually she uh, worked with the women on what they liked to see on the wall because there were no windows to look outside. So they decided on this idea of making their own views of what they'd like to see. And at the time, Judith Shea was making wooden sculptures that were figure, figurative. And this is the project that she uh, made with the shelter residents, their, self, their portraits. And if there's time, is there time for me to show a few of the works I was making at the same time? Why not? I guess. Yes. Okay, Midori <laughs> had mentioned that. So while I was making this work with my colleagues and my shelter colleagues, artist colleagues, um, it gave me the courage to make art about the rape I had suffered and the violence. Because before that, my work always alluded to it. And, but it never explicitly represented it. 
And so I engaged in the series called Memory Spaces Time that parallel all the work that you just saw and basically had a, a colleague pose for this first image that represented the rape that she suffered too. And uh, the process was appealing the silver print from the back of the fiber base, which I made my own prints. And then I peeled them from the fiber base, separating the figure from the ground, which is how we felt having experienced rape, being completely alienated and separated from the ground that we always knew, which was very much like the women in the shelter who suffered both the rape and violence. And luckily, she, my friend and I didn't, they suffered the loss of the place they thought they belonged, which was their home. And here's four of the pieces that were in the solo exhibition I was commissioned to do. It's all the same friend that's posing. Uh, these, you see these pieces are quite large. Hmm. And then mem uh, this is memories and then spaces was meant to represent a time of um, reconnecting to the world through culture and also the icons of religion that are supposed to offer refuge, but don't quite. And basically I, photo I made these photographs of figures and then tore them up and repinned them back together also. And here's three of them together in that same show. Can I just ask a question, Hope? Um, of course, I'm done. You, That's yeah, it. Okay. Were you making any of these while the Artists and Homeless Collaborative still existed? Or was it all after? of them? Everything all that them? I just, all this whole series I made at the same time and showed them. Oh, and did, did the um, women see them? Did the women no. see any of your work? No. And what was your reason for that? Um, well, the pieces I collaborated with them on, they did see and they went to the art openings with me. These mm -hmm. were not, um, they didn't really want to venture out that much and yeah. be identified as being in the shelter. Mm -hmm. So, but you could see that I was into peeling. I peeled all those Polaroids, you know, when I led those projects with the Polaroids, I didn't like the way they looked stiff on the backgrounds of the Polaroid backing. Just like I didn't like, this, I just like I peeled these silver prints. So everything I did at that decade were pretty much peeled images. I was feeling really alienated. I was really distressed by the response of people not wanting to change legislation or services for women in need. Uh, the fact that the ERA hadn't still been passed, even though it was introduced when I was in art school. So was peeling all the Polaroids and the silver print fragments represented my frustration of, of change not happening. And the idea of the peeling was to free us from the past and move us to go forward. It also, for me, it also suggests pain. Was that an issue for you at all? I mean, did you think about every that? day of my life still yeah. now every yeah. day I'm in pain, you know, and anguish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are very, very powerful. Um, so I think um, I, I, I moved away for a couple of minutes because one of my cats threw up. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> She hasn't appeared yet, like yesterday. <laughs> no, not yet. Hopefully she won't. Um, well, I'll just I, say that you can see that through my own work and through the work in, with the shelter artists and my colleagues, we investigated the relevancy of, of art to life every single moment. And the artworks express that. And I'm really thrilled and honored that I had the opportunity to work with so many people that were so talented. And I learned so much. I always said, 
in this project, I felt like I learned the most. And do you think it continues to impact your work in some way? Absolutely. Uh, I learned about human emotion and I'm an only child, so I never really knew what other people were thinking. So it was terrific to learn so much from other people. And I also started, I mentioned, I started the art education project at the Whitney and MoMA with a Warhol Foundation grant in 1992 with Dina Halal and Philip Yenowin at MoMA. And the project at the Whitney continues to this day. It's still, they're still, um, having workshops with children in the family shelter and working with the teens that are paid to teach. Just as Dean and I start and Philip started it in 1992. That's wow. incredibly thrilling. And a group of those art educators came and met me at the show on Friday and we celebrated because that's a very long time for a program. And I mean, very appreciative of the directors, David Ross, Max Anderson, and now more recently, and now forever, I hope, uh, Adam Weinberg, because they make that possible. They've been funding that project all these years. It's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want, can I ask you a question? Um, I wonder why, like, the deep sort of like traumatic experience of women are uh, not seriously taken by the society. I think it's the important topic and to hope you said yesterday that not many media was taking the, the art for change exhibition um, more like into in a consideration of writing a serious article about it. And uh, I've also like noticed that when people hear a lot about uh, women's inherent uh, experiences, I think in generally in like uh, art history, it's not something which has been preferred. But exactly. It's very important because this is the voice which didn't have a place in history. And after the 70s, I think it's really like the time when we can finally hear these voices. And then it seems like there's no ear to, to listen to it. Yeah, and that, that was very shocking to me that in these decades that hasn't changed. Uh, I had hoped that someone would look at the resumes and write about their the women's work experiences and see how they've been actively employed before suffering trauma, but no one did. It was, and then look at the work that was made, the art that was created and, and link them just as you say, Midori, it's very disappointing. In some ways there was more interest then uh, the project was written about in a New York Times art forum, flash art, a whole host of publications wrote about the project then. Do you have any idea what might have changed or why this is the case right now that it hasn't gotten the attention? And also, I just want to mention that I think, you know, I think it's very interesting and I, I'm really glad that your show, the show took place at a non-art institution. And that might be, on the one hand, that might be a reason they're not taking it as seriously, but I think it's also um, so easy for um, work of this kind to be sort of co-opted into the art world and become commodified in a sense. And that's not really, it's as far as I'm concerned, that's not its purpose, purpose at all. And I think, one of the great things about being at the um, New York Historical Society is that if they did their job of reaching out to all kinds of communities, it's in some ways, um, you know, can be more accessible than a 
than a really fancy, um, glitzy art gallery. <laughs> um, did you did you get a sense from the organizers that there was you know a good audience for the show? Well, the pandemic cut into three oh. months of the four months, um, basically. Wow. Yeah, they couldn't have public programming and their staff was working at home most of those three months. It's only the last month that people started getting out and, and traveling up to see the show. However, the press office did reach out to all those publications. And, and maybe it goes to that question of who is an artist and who makes art that we'll look at. Yeah, I wish that dialogue had happened, but the fact that the pandemic happened really affected any outreach or communications and a lot of people were fearful of traveling uptown to see the show, you know, just on a personal level because of COVID. It seems like in New York City, people are just getting out the last couple of weeks to go to art openings. I, I remember that I wanted to go on the day after the opening of the exhibition, but there was a COVID uh, Omicron surge that uh, yes. you know, to go out. Uh, but one thing which I recognized is really like you, you were on the very front line where you could have made a huge change, you know, if you didn't fall in sick. Yes. And if and, and it's really like a project, I think if you did it again at the, you know, Amory or any other women's shelters, I think this is really a wonderful um, experience that you can provide to homeless people, especially uh, I've studied like Timothy really and like behave uh, behavioral science and uh, in a lot of cases it's really an uh, environment uh, that affects people and their conduct and uh, their uh, perceptions and the way you change that fifth floor tv room with all the clothes fabric and made it more homely and i, I noticed i have to notice like the shelters were deliberately nasty place it, it seems like uh, every bed or every furniture were made deliberately ugly where people will become more depressed in such an environment and i i think you are doing something which is very important for those people who are living in the shelter well that was why they look so affectionate towards me yeah. <laughs> you know, in the video but, um in that room was a poem written by Diane Dobrun, a resident uh, called Homeless Blues. Paypon worked with her on this room and, and incorporated her, her poem. It was on the wall. Oh, hi, Maureen. Hi. Uh, the thing is that in that basketball court was Diane's bed. And on her bed, she when I met her, she had on her sheets, she had written that poem on her sheets. So I was really impressed that the women were making art even on their beds, because uh, that's all they had. And that, and then Pepon took that poem and and painted it on the walls. Hmm. Um, I don't see any <clears throat> hands to raise here, um, or I can't find the hand to raise, but I want to ask a question, which is the question that we've been discussing ever since we first started working on the show. Um, it has, yeah. it has to do, of course, with uh, with the stigma against people who are homeless or have been homeless. And, um, you know, uh, so that's on the one hand, there's this stigma. On the other hand, there's somebody like Tracy Emin who, you know, who wrote on her sheets and wrote about all of the people that she slept with and, uh, you know, and that as Midori was saying, that was, uh, well, she wasn't talking about that, but, but that, you know, it has to do with the context where it was shown. And, and in that context, it became, you know, sexualized and, uh, you know, and therefore 
a somehow more, uh, you know, uh, transgressive and interesting to the art world. Uh, so I'm just wondering about that. I know that was something that you really tried to work sort of against is the, the stigma and trying to, you know, mm -hmm. dispel that. But I'm wondering if you think that's still something that uh, keeps people from being engaged with this project or um, or if it's also just the, the whole question of, you know, the commodity culture around the arts right now. I think that's true, what you're saying, the last part. Mm -hmm. And also we were discussing the other day, a lot of this is not necessarily uh, racism as much as it's classism. So right. these women are seen as poor and that was why I did the resume project to show that they had been actively employed until they met violence or misfortune and or illness. Mm -hmm. And at the time, these resumes were taken very seriously. I probably foisted one on you, Maureen, at the time. No, you on these booklets. <laughs> but, but I was very interested in them uh, when you told me about them more recently. Um, but the because I was always carrying them around these bound booklets of resumes, because when people would say, oh, these women are useless, I'd say, well, wait a minute, look at their resumes. Um, right. But in this show, not one writer picked up on it and wrote about that. And that's a huge loss because that's still happening now, that stigma and of who these women, you know, once you become homeless, you're thought of as useless. Oh, and you're thought of, well, you must always have been useless because you don't have anything anymore. And, and I was really disappointed that the resumes weren't discussed and that a writer did not look into their backgrounds and say, wow, violence is, against women is really serious. Look, look what it did to these women or, or lack of medical care. I think Shandy has a question. No, not really a question, just an observation of frustration. You know, when you mentioned the women who didn't have resumes or people assumed that they had no skills, let's say they didn't have a work history. Some mm -hmm. of them could have been stay at home people for whatever reason. That doesn't mean that they're not able to be taught, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Aside from that, living in a state of extreme poverty or violence, more often than not, depletes you of everything else. So there is no space left for, for what? For building a career? For, for, for learning? There is very little space for that because all your energy is literally going to survive. And most people don't understand that because they've luckily never experienced it. That's really what's frustrating and just enraging to experience and to hear from people like, oh, you're homeless. Oh, immediately something's wrong with you. Yeah, there might be something wrong with me, but I need something to get out of that space. Well said, that's very true. And the stigma was really strong, Maureen. For example, uh, I'd, I'd attend some art openings and one of the women from the shelter would be there. And she would always put her finger over her lips, like, don't tell anybody how you know me. She would say hi to me, and that was it. Mm. It was really curious. Uh, I know. Do you want to do the project again at the shelter, like some, maybe the same shelter? And maybe that might help change things now because uh, your project is really well known by now. Well, I guess if they invited me there, um, I mean, currently my life, so I only, the project only ended because I was sexually assaulted by a dentist who then poorly treated me and I almost died as a result of it. Um, 21 years in recovery and my work changed to helping because uh, I'm now living on eastern Long Island with my husband our neighbors are indigenous people who also lost their homes the place where they belong the land 
And so my attention has, for the last 20 years, has been advocating for them to regain their ancestral lands. So even though it's different, it's not, it's a different situation. It's a similar problem of loss. But it is interesting, you know, um, since the advent of um, not so much identity politics, because I, I, I'm sorry, um, uh, yeah, identity politics, um, there are certain identities that are getting more attention these days. And um, I think that be, being poor and being homeless is not one that has been in a sense commodified and um, which it shouldn't be, none of these should be. And I think um, it's just an interesting phenomenon as you mentioned, you're working with native natives, Native Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an area that is getting more attention uh, now. And, you know, also from some politicians, um, you know, sadly in New York City, I mean, we've talked about this behind the scenes, but you have someone like um, Eric Adams as mayor and uh, which is a total nightmare for, um, you know, for underserved communities in general. And certainly these women would be part of that. And here you have a black man who is, you know, no better at representing his, his own people <laughs> than someone else might be. So it's, it's kind of a very interesting, um, you know, complicated time. And I think, um, you know, it, it also interests me to know whether now, whether the population of a homeless shelter would be more, uh, would there be fewer white women, do you think? Or would, would it still be a mixed community? Because one of the things to me that's interesting about this very mixed community is that um, the whole idea of solidarity among people who are suffering or people who are um, underserved in general is, as we're seeing recently with unions, you know, the formation, for example, with Amazon, when you look mm -hmm. at photographs, you see people of all colors there and they're really um, organizing around their shared needs. And I think this is very lacking in the art world. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's one of the, to me, one of the crimes of, of the art world um, that it's, uh, and I, you know, I wonder whether that's part of the reason there hasn't been the kind of coverage that their, your work and, and, and you know, the show at um, um, Kingsborough certainly deserves. Um, I just, you know, I just, it's just complicated, I think. Um, Anyway, I'm curious about you guys who are in the academic world. I mean, how do you feel about um, the, this issue as a, the, what I, well, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, I think identity politics is a very important thing and that we should all be, you know, we should all be um, very, um, you know, proud and of who we are. I'm talking really about what I would call the divisive the way it, it's become weaponized and has become a, a, a divisive um, weapon in a sense among people. And this is very uh, prevalent in the art world. You know, it, we've seen lots of examples of that, which I think is very unfortunate. Um, and I think, I mean, one of the extraordinary things hope about, I mean, your project that wasn't so much of an issue at that time, or at least it wasn't a, you know, a, a kind of hot issue, hot button issue, um, is that it sounded to me from what you've said is that there were women of all backgrounds that were there. Yes. Um, and there was a, a sense of community. Um, well, a sense of community in our project, but if you, you see the quote of Geraldine, she's saying the women feel very insecure and yeah. they were scared. Mm -hmm. but yeah, there was a camaraderie among the artists that. I brought in and the artists that were there. The um, there's always the question of people in need. What is the importance of spending money on art? I mean, that was something I also came up against. That well, don't these people need blankets or clothes? But why spend money on on art? It was also a big question then. The women were from all 
classes and, and backgrounds. So it was very diverse. I don't know what it would be like now. I think there's more charities that are, are more affiliated with religions that maybe the, would filter the women into different places than the city shelter. I, it's, I hard to, it's hard to know, but women suffering from violence are probably still headed there. I think there is uh, a contribution in the chat from Cindy that's about the race and the class divide. Uh, Cindy, would you like to speak about? Oh, Cindy's not here. Oh, Cindy's not here. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Oh, I don't see her. Uh, I think we only see like five people at the time. So I think yeah. she's here, but. I'm not sure if her microphone is on. But I wonder if seeing only five people is also a reflection of the fact of uh, how, how has the response been to your show to the subject of your titling it Unhomeless New York City? And how do you feel in general the response to your show has been? Is it similar to your other shows? Uh, it's quite different because I think it involves more of the community and uh, we are in, on Manhattan Beach, so you usually don't get a lot of people in the gallery, but uh, we've been getting a lot of tours uh, of the classes within the campus. Uh, even that doesn't happen usually. And we are also getting people from outside and uh, we are very lucky that uh, one of our curators is a homeless activist uh, person and uh, he has been very uh, he is a very good organizer i have to say and he has been actively um, involved in planning and we are just about to get like two articles which it's really maybe like the first time the museum is getting any articles, you know, or maybe the second time. So it's that much like far from the art community. But I do have a very positive feeling about uh, um, the exhibition. And students need to access to these recordings. And then they've been writing a lot of um, afterthoughts about what they been exposed to and one thing which came up again and again is really our society doesn't really have a safe net and many students have written that they thought homelessness is unrelated to their life but when you start looking at what's going on in society like in willy baronet's film about interviewing homeless people on the street it can just happen to you at any any time at any moment because there's really no safety net in this society and i think that's one of the things which needs to be created like if you become ill and if you cannot pay your bills there must be some ways to save you from not losing your home and i've seen in some televisions that there was a man who just got operation in the hospital and then he was left on the wheelchair in the street corner it's almost throwing mm -hmm. away someone who is deeply injured and deeply sick so yeah that was what i came across some of the women had cancer and lost their apartments and jobs while they were being treated and then the house bellevue would send them to the shelter oh and then they'd be having to go there for their treatments and having to pay for an ambulance to take them because that was the only way to get from the shelter on 68th Street to Bellevue. So it was quite expensive and they paid for it. It's taken out of their benefits. 
So it, it never, never helped them to move forward to saving money. And it kept them in the same situation that um, until the city created some transitional housing on 42nd Street, and many of the women in that shelter at the armory were moved into that housing, which became permanent. So for example, the maker of the self-portrait on the left, Theo Shops, and she was an artist in almost every project. She and Marion, who both of these figures, um, they were moved to that shelter and, and Marion returned to the South where she's from, the figure on the right. Uh, Theo lived there till this past summer when she died, which we were so devastated because we were looking forward to welcoming her to the reception. And Nina had asked earlier, the show was supposed to, to schedule for two years ago, and then the pandemic happened. And it certainly affected the attendance. In the last month, a lot of people have come, including um, kind of surprising Coalition for the Homeless <clears throat> has a piece in the show, and they only came the last day of the show. So it's certainly the pandemic and the fear of COVID, which is true, should be, uh, really affected the amount of people that, that did see the show. Yeah, so yeah. Theo passed away. Yeah. And Mary. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Um, one of the things Midori brought up a little while ago is how um, it, it's something that I've, my thinking has evolved a lot since the book came out in 1995. You know, I actually wrote a new introduction to the, un, the now unpublished second. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. With, uh, okay, oh. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. I had trouble with my slides for my cursor. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Um, and in my so please have to sound, Nina. Oh, really? Yeah. Can you? Can anyone hear me? Now we can. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, is that all these issues? You know, whether it's your practice, hope, or any of the others that are featured in the book, they they are all. Um, you have to look at the, the whole situation as being systemic. It's not, you know, housing, housing issues is totally related to lack of proper health care or lack mm -hmm. of a, you know, mental health care system. And they're all, and I think that's, again, one of the things that I think um, is problematic in our society right now, that they're not dealt with systemically because we have a society that is, you know, basically, um, um, dominated by liberal neoliberal policies, and um, it, and that has created the greatest inequities we've ever seen in this country. Um, things were a lot better in, I mean, started to turn around, you know, in the late seventies and eighties. But um, this is, I think, about the worst it's been. And I think that the pandemic um, and the impact of the pandemic and the George Floyd murder really foregrounded these issues in an amazing way. And um, for me, at least, it really, it really made me, these things came together. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I sort of see your work now, Hope, um, in, as part of that, as part of a much broader context, really. And well, I terrific. Think it, yeah. Well, I was going to say the build, what really transfixed me, and you see in the video that Ulf made that's in your show, you see the mixed use in that building. It brought together not just women that were seeking shelter on the third and the fifth floor, but the first floor was the military. The second floor was one of, you know, also the military. And then the third, the fourth floor was the regiment armory mess, which was an upper class restaurant for Park Avenue people. And then the bottom floor was the tennis court. Actually, the first floor was also a tennis court. And still to this day, there's a shooting range in the basement. So entering that building and, and using the elevators and being with all these people and um, was kind of even, so the women had to enter from the side. They couldn't enter the front. But there was only one elevator. So they would get on the elevator from the third or fifth floor and they'd have curlers in their hair and they'd be in their house robes. 
And then socialites would be there to go to the restaurant. Um, and then there'd be people in their tennis whites. It was a, like, as it was fascinating than what you're saying about a more systemic cross-culture mixing of people. And, and I think Ulf's video that's in your show really captures that. And, and also there were times when those people going to the fourth floor restaurant got off on the third floor by mistake and they were really shaken by um, being amongst the shelter residents. Another, another irony about that place um, in terms of your project, um, Hope, and the kind of art projects that go on there now, um, which are these mm -hmm. very high production valued performances that, you know, for the most part, I would, maybe they don't all attract just people from the art world, but certainly the audience is a very privileged audience because it's not free to go to them. And, um, and of course those, those projects get very well covered by the press. Um, so yes. it's very expensive to go to most of them. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, I know. Well, on the third and fifth floor, the fourth and fifth floor, there's still a shelter. Is there really? Wow. Yeah, it's run by Lennox Hill. There, so when they took over, the our artworks were supposed to be there permanently always. Um, so the finished artworks, but they don't, but they took them down. We don't know what happened to them, except for John Ahern's and Rigoberto Torres. They donated them to the Newark Historic Society, those four plaster sculptures. They, they told John that they wanted to sell them. And he said, oh no. And they got donated to the New York Historic Society, which is how the show happened. I didn't ask for a show and I was really reticent to do one because I knew it was gonna be rough. We're dealing, we're dealing with all these issues that still remain unresolved and, and people don't want change. They wanna keep things as they are, especially if they're in power. Um, the I mean, ERA is still not passed. But at the same time, there's so much work around, you know, the socially engaged art and social practice. Mm -hmm. And one of one of the strongest impressions of your show uh, was, you know, just the sense of of the history of that period and all of the different parts that came together to create the movement that that had an impact into the 90s, you know, and the late 80s and into the 90s, when things, people started to become more aware first um, through the AIDS virus and, and all of the illnesses, but then in relation to that, uh, just a, more of a focus on health issues and the body um, and, and the whole idea of identity politics, which really arose in the late 80s. So uh, I feel like one of the one of the big lacks in terms of the discussions around your around the uh, New York Historical Society show was that lack of, of connections between the, the present time and, and issues that people are working around and toward and you know how that laid a lot of the groundwork for you know, projects that, that people are, are working on now, but at the same time, not really any acknowledgement. You know, it, it seemed like, like something that was a natural subject for, uh, I don't know, one of the New York Times writers who've been around for, you know, since no. that time to write about. Absolutely. And I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's, it's really, I'd, I'd really like to know their answers. Right. But I had a hard time getting the New York Times to write about the women in the 90s and, and writers that all of us read their opinion pieces and thought they were, they would have been happy to write about women over 40 who suffered violence and, and in the shelter and not one of them would write. The, what the New York Times wrote about was the Red Ribbon Project that Frank and I created. But they weren't, 
there's still a reticence to work, to writing about women who've suffered violence or discrimination. Unless, unless they happen to be Hollywood celebrities. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, that's, that's incredible, but that's where we live. <laughs> Well, I have the archives, and if any of you know anyone that's interested in really looking seriously at this work, I'll have the archives again, and, and I'd really appreciate what the women had to say be taken ser more seriously and looked at. I'm, cu I'm curious, since um, Midori brought this up before about would you consider um, starting up a, a the Artist and Homeless Collaborative again, um, and what would what would stop you? I mean, do you think it couldn't happen now, or um, or is it mainly what you said about being invited? But of course, an invitation doesn't come unless someone knows that you're you're on the, you know, oh, yeah, <laughs> well, you're, you're interested. I wouldn't call it Artist and Homeless Collaborative again. Right. I would probably, I had, that was kind of like, think of something quick because I had applied for a grant. Mm -hmm. I, when I got the nonprofit status after NIFA sponsored the project, I called it Artist Response To. So if any projects I had, I really liked that title because then it doesn't differentiate between different people. We're all artists and it's really, it would really be a response to specific issues. So I would call it that. I'm not sure if it could happen again because of privacy issues. There, are, It was very serious then. And now it would be even more so having access to the shelter and to the people that live there. Um, but I'd be interested in investigating it if someone invites me. Of course, then I didn't need an invitation. I did it, but now I know better. <laughs> it's much better to be invited than to and to go with the flow of what's needed and and appreciated. Then um, it was a moment, like Maureen said, it, there were guerrilla girls, visual aids, freedom of freedom of expression coalition. I was also part of. Every night there was a different meeting of, of activism that I went to and I was part of a whole group. Well, well it's interesting also to me that um, apart from, I mean, the one group that I'm, I'm fascinated by that has continued from that time is um, um, Kids, of, um, Kids of Survival. Um, what's his name? <laughs> oh, but Tim died. Oh, yeah, but Tim died, but they go yeah. on and- yeah. Um, and they're carrying on that work, which is quite amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly enough, from the outside, they've been attacked, um, or Tim was attacked for using Western literature when, you know, his, mm -hmm. his um, the participants were black and 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 kids of color. And they, because I listened to several um, webinars that were that were done by the um, National Academy of Science in Washington, because they did a project with them, um, and they are. It's very interesting interesting to hear them talk about it because they felt that they could make that Western literature their own, and um, so the the criticism has come in, come externally. Um, but in fact, they don't feel that way. And uh, they continue to use, I mean, they've introduced a lot of other stuff, a lot of black writers and, um, but they've really, I mean, it's just extraordinary how empowered they became to continue their work as educators. And, and it's very rare that um, a practice does that, that, you know, can be sustained for um, 40 years, let's say, or, you know, 35 years. No, um, I think you're right. I mean, often what happens with, with um, uh, socially engaged practices that are collaborative and there are artists involved, I think, is that um, at least this was true then um, because a number of the groups in the book that I did um, disbanded. And, um, you know, in some cases they, 
the artists wanted to do their own work um, and, um, or they just guess, I guess they just ran out of steam. Um, so um, I'm just curious, Maureen, you've done a lot of work on more recent stuff. Um, do you feel that there's a very active community of social practice artists who, who are, who, whose work or whose projects are, are sustained? By the way, I just want to mention that I learned when I was rewrite, when I was redoing my essay, our new introduction, that the term social practice only started to be used in around 2005. So when we did the book, Hope, that was not even in use. Right. We were called activists. Yeah, yeah that art, art, art activists or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or it's used in, in, in social science and it has a different meaning. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Social so, practice is, is what we all do every day. Right. All the time. You know? Yeah. Uh, so how do you think more, more current groups are different? Well, I, I, honestly, I'm not sure they are. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think just in my own practices, uh, it's, it's hard to sustain a group and people do tend to want to make their own careers, you know? Yeah. And, um, and this is one of the things that, that has struck me recently that I feel like there are a number of artists who, who get very engaged with a particular group of people or, or a, um, an issue. And then, and I, I just, I feel this myself, you know, that I, I reach a point where there's no, uh, that there's, there's no impact or there's very little impact that you can actually have on the issues you're working around. And, and, and so it sort of makes sense that a lot of artists get sidetracked at that moment into trying to create a career. And they think that somehow creating the career is gonna make the help, help them make the impact. But I'm not sure that it really does. You know, um, and I think sometimes people just get a little bit sidelined into making art rather than than taking that that leap beyond. Also, it's hard to know where to leap. You know, once you reach a certain limit. Uh, right. You know, uh, so. But but I, you know, I, I feel that's something I've just started to feel very recently that um, that the art world at a certain point or, an, or a, an art career can end up being a trap for artists who really are socially engaged and socially active and want to make yeah. a difference. Well, There's I think, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was thinking uh, because recently, I don't know if you're you're aware of this, but the Yes Men had a show up at Carriage Trade and yes. Uh, Carriage Trade is not a commercial gallery. It's a not-for-profit space. And the guy who runs it is an artist and a writer himself. And I think that um, projects that exist outside the art world, uh, you know, and have a better chance. When I say exist outside the art world, don't the, the artists don't also have a career in the art world or choose not to, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that they might be more sustainable and I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I know, I mean, I, I totally understand why artists want to make their own work. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, maybe those two things just don't go hand in hand. And I also think that, you know, the very fact that work like this can raise one's consciousness and get people to think about issues is very, very important. You know, I think um, maybe art is not in itself, um, it just doesn't have the ability to actually change laws and maybe it shouldn't be mm. demanded of art, you know? Right. Um, well, the show brought a lot of happiness to many people seeing the work again. 
and made them a more, you know, reminded them of these issues that they hadn't been thinking of. Uh, it, had, it had a positive, really positive effect, but it's not, but not in terms of the media or among us artists. I had incredible emails from our colleagues, Maureen, saying how touched they were by the work. Mm -hmm. Others by who participated. Um, Adam Weinberg called it historic. Many people called the show historic. Adam Weinberg called it that? He should yes. bring it to the Whitney Museum. <laughs> he what? <laughs> or he should bring some something to the Whitney Museum. Well, they've had the project for third for 20 years. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. But that's yeah. a, that's more of an educational project, isn't it, at this point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other people said equally the same thing because it brought together the Gorilla Girls and Visual Aids working with this group of people. So in that way, the show was, the emails I received were incredibly meaningful and exciting and terrific. And the disappointment is really what you're talking about now. How can it change the situation? And why didn't writers pick up on these themes like the resume project and what the women are saying they needed because change can't happen unless we listen. Well, and, I feel like what you were, were just saying, Nina, was um, you know that just like with activism, like things run their course, and those of us who've been around for a long time are seeing. Oops! Oh, Maureen, we lost you. Your sound is off, Maureen. No. Oh. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, no. Now we hear you. Uh, no. Now you're okay. Yeah. No, Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that I forget. I don't know where you lost me. That, that oh, you said you that it run certain issues run their course or practice runs its course. That's yeah. right. And and that we have to find other ways to yeah. address those issues. And you know, and I think the same thing happens. You know, with an art project. And you know, it reaches a limit of, of yeah. the impact it can have. And then are you talking about the Institute of Wishful Thinking? Or when you say our art project, which what are you referring to? Well, I'm just referring to art projects in general. Oh, okay. You know, that, yeah. that they're responding to a particular moment, like your project at the at the the armory, you know, that mm -hmm. was a moment and and it, it can't really be created. It has to be you know, whatever you're responding to, if you were to do that again, it, I, I feel like it would have to be to, to the present conditions. And then yeah. a lot of those issues wouldn't quite work in the same way. I agree, There's, okay. it's a different time. Yeah. yeah, with a lot of art projects in the same way that activist projects also run their course. And, you know, you think something's resolved yeah. right. and it isn't. It never yeah, like with AIDS. It's never yeah. going to be resolved. You never you can never stop mm -hmm. actually with your activism. Right. Well, I think people feel that AIDS is over. So the AIDS organizations like Visual AIDS struggle. I don't know personally that they do, but I guess that. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting with the pandemic, a number of um people who were involved in with Grand Fury, which was another AIDS activist group. Mm -hmm compared the neglect of underserved populations by the government during the pandemic to the fact that they were ignored by the government, people with AIDS uh, back in the 80s. And so there is, there are these interesting kind of threads. And again, it's systemic, you know, it's really about um, the form of the lack of human services, really. Um, you know, and, and also I I don't know why, but like the government don't want to give money to protect the people without money. I mean, this Buffalo Bill Studio, which is eighty five million dollars, and it's being <laughs> run by billionaires, and why can't they just pay for that? And because they don't a little them. of it, just a little of it. Yeah, bring that money to help you know, create housing for the people. And I see like, you know, the Park Avenue Amory residents, they are very vulnerable situation and 
they seem very much hard. They need to be treated to, with the care, but like when they were creating portrait with the Polaroid of the security guard, I mean, he was like a prison guard, like, you know, treating these people like a, a criminal or something. And you cannot tolerate such a circumstance when you have mental issue. And it seems like this is a system which is going to really exploit people who have less power. I agree. I mean, it's all around us. And, and that's a big disappointment that we're older than you, Midori, Maureen, and Nina and I. Um, I think we all thought we would have changed that in the 70s. We had these dreams. And sadly, people of our own generation are leaders of this country. Uh, we're not of the same beliefs that we are, and look where we are now. It's really discouraging. Yeah, it's not. It's not that different from Jeff Bezos not being not being willing to pay his workers a decent amount of money. It just it's pervasive, you know, in this society. Yes. Well, the society is based on some people being exploited. In inequity. A large of them. Inequity. Yeah. yeah. And interestingly, a lot of people are now saying, well, indigenous people are getting attention, but I, I interact with them on an almost daily basis, my neighbors. They don't feel like that. They're, yeah. they, they, feel like, they feel like they're still treated badly, hated, discriminated against, and, uh, and are really devastated and, and, and exhausted, just like the women in the shelter. So they're not feeling the trickle down yet. My yeah. neighbors, anyway, they're not feeling the trickle down. They're, there's some relief right now. Well, I think it's getting, it's again, I'm going back to this identity politics thing. I mean, when we see, um, when we see, um, many more black artists being shown in galleries and um, you know people of color and all that it doesn't change anything for the people at the bottom of color you know it it but it makes people in gallery you know gallery owners and whatever whatever area it happens to be feel like they're doing good in the world. And um, unfortunately, it, and, and that's, you know, that's why I, you see it like on the hyperallergic website, tons of stuff about Native American artists. And so it's easy to think they're getting a lot of attention, but mm -hmm. as you say, Hope, the people, um, most, most Native Americans, most blacks, most people of color, um, Asian Americans are being treated like shit. <laughs> you know, and not getting the services they need. I mean, Asian Americans more, I'm thinking more of the recent, you know, hate crimes against them. Um, it's, um, it's, it's very discouraging, really. I mean, I, I, ha I hate to be so half empty, but. Well, my friend is an artist that's getting a lot of attention, a Shinnecock. I have two friends that are getting a lot of attention in the art world who are uh, Shinnecock artists. Mm -hmm. And he's, one of them told me, that he went to a NIFA seminar where you're supposed to discuss your career and how to move forward. And most of the other people there were complaining that too much attention is being paid to black and indigenous and queer artists and that straight white artists are being treated terribly. So we kind of had a chuckle over that. But when Jimmy Durham's retrospective took place at the Whitney, it was fabulous, yeah. Well, I was shocked because I was invited to this panel discussion to listen to it. And then everyone was talking whether he was a real Cherokee or not. And it didn't Great. really go <laughs> beyond that discussion. Yeah. And the work to speak so much more and why can't they translate that into more like you know easy words for regular people to understand it was just so ridiculous and this was like going on for like 45 minutes and then there was really mm. nothing meaningful spoken by the panelists and they were like Cherokee people 
from the real Cherokee reservation and they were talking that uh, we are Cherokees and he's not because he was born in Texas. Yeah. I remember that his show was terrific and I remember it was overshadowed by that discussion. It was very sad. It was very, very disappointing. Well, and I don't feel that much has changed for women, a little bit, but um, yeah, we're in dire circumstances. The war in Ukraine and Russia is really upsetting. And so it's a little bit after one hour and 30 minutes. So I would like to thank you all for uh, this panel and it's been recorded. So it will be hopefully heard by uh, other people.